Okay, let's start. Today is the last day, uh, so I'm not going to show you too many additional things. What I will prefer is to, that we get an idea of uh, what remains to be done. Effective field theory is not uh, a goal, it's just a tool to do physics. So you need to understand the tool, you need to understand what do you want to do with it. It will not solve all the problems. It only allows you to do something more model independent than the things we're used to. But there are many questions that uh, the th effective theory will not answer. And what is important is to identify which things can do and which things cannot, because then you need something in addition. Remember where we were yesterday, I was showing you that uh, in the electroweak theory, the physics of the longitudinal Ws and Zs is the physics of the Goldstone bosons, and the, the Goldstone dynamics is exactly the same that in QCD, except for symmetry breaking terms. But of course, uh, the bulk of the unknown physics in the electroweak sector is precisely in the symmetry breaking part. So it's, it's there where we need to face very serious problems because we don't understand much and is where we need to investigate. So remember first that we saw that uh, we have the scattering of four longitudinal gauge bosons. So we expect the amplitude to grow as energy to the fourth power. But then there is first a strong gauge cancellation which reduces it to energy to the second power. And then in addition, we have the Higgs contributions which cancel two powers more in energy, so finally we have a constant amplitude. Okay. But we have a huge cancellation, which decreases by four powers the power in energy of the amplitude. So whatever you do to introduce new physics and touch the electroweak theory, you need to remember that better you guarantee that there is this... Uh, improvement by four powers of energy so that you get the right physics. So you cannot uh, change these couplings by a large factor, you cannot change these couplings by a large factor. Okay, this is uh, lowest order physics, it's just the standard model. But then we have parameterized any possible type of new physics in the bosonic sector, that means gauge, plus the scalar interactions. Anything which respect custodial symmetry can only have this form with four derivatives. And of course, all these magenta things are symmetry breaking terms, so we don't understand much. The only thing that we know is that we need 15 unknown coupling constants, and those coupling constants are what are going to make the difference between a given model and a different model in the electroweak sector. We also saw, so we call the couplings by some letter A, remember that, A from A0 to A14. I have shown to you a table of three particular limits of the standard model, taking some object to infinity, and which kind of low energy couplings do you get, which means that if you are able to measure some of these couplings at some point, you have a hint on which kind of new physics could be behind it. Okay, let's drop all that. Let's go now to the one-loop level, because up to now that was uh, three-level physics. So now we take again the scattering of two longitudinal Ws at one loop. Of course, if instead of putting these scalar graphs you put uh, the corresponding graphs with virtual Ws and Zs, and you remember the form of the spin-1 propagators, this is a very hard calculation. It has been done in the standard model, but it's a very tough one with a lot of combinatorics. However, I didn't make the calculation. I have taken one paper of pion-pion scattering in QCD of 20 years ago, and I have copied the result. Because it's the same calculation, once we understand that longitudinal W scattering is Goldstone scattering, okay? so it's the pi-pi scattering formula. The only work I have uh, 
been forced to do is I have put to zero the pion masses because symmetry breaking terms are different in QCD that in the electrowick sector. And instead of having the L couplings, L1, L2, L3, that characterize the gasser leubiller lagrangian in QCD, we have these A1 couplings of uh, upper quiz long term. So it's just change in notation. And of course, the amplitude is this result at very high energies up to corrections of order nw squared divided by s. So that's good. You don't need to do the calculation. And now you look to the calculation. Of course, these loops give divergences. The divergences are renormalized or reabsorbed in the couplings of the next to leading Lagrangian. And you know perfectly well the divergent part of these couplings, so you can check that everything works fine. And of course, the question is what is the value of these parameters, because the, there is where the short distance physics is hidden. But it's more than that. Now you look to the result. The lowest order amplitude was growing as S, energy square. Okay. Here I have written the general amplitude A, B, C, D are isospin indexes, normal isospin for QCD or electroweak isospin for the electroweak <coughs> sector, so that in the electroweak sector A, B, C, D means W plus W minus at zero. And depending on which stage you take, so you have these Kronecker deltas, you have a combination, but it's always the same amplitude, A of S, T, U, which is given by that. So, at lowest order, it grows as S, or as T, or as U. It's energy square. But once you go to next to leading order, it grows as S square. It's much worse. So, you violate unitarity earlier. It's just an effective theory. The effective theory cannot be valid to arbitrary high scales. So, at some point, the validity of the effective theory gets cut, then you need something else. But, you know, this is growing, and of course, all these logarithmic corrections, those are what is called chiral locks, which dominate usually the corrections, they come with a factor S squared. Well, but this is not the complete standard model calculation, because this is the Goldstone contribution to this process. I, just, I have just copied pi on pi on scattering. The standard model has something more because it contains the Higgs. And the Higgs couples to two Ws, to two Zs. Okay, that's something which is not there in QCV. It's new. So, you just add, this is the lowest order Goldstone Lagrangian. Here, I have already included A4 and A5. So, I have included the next to leading order Goldstone Lagrangian, which is here. Okay, but now, I include three level couplings of the Higgs particle, which is a light particle, to the Goldstones. So this will be part of the leading order Lagrangian once I include the Higgs. And I have put just arbitrary couplings A and B, and now you compute. So you get the result I had before with plenty of corrections, which involve A and B. Okay. And of course, the a4 and A5 had a divergent piece, which now gets changed because the Higgs also enters in loops. You include the Higgs at the tree level and in the loops. And you can see all these funny contributions everywhere of many A's and many B's, which are the Higgs couplings. What happens in the standard model? A is 1, B is 1, A4, of course, is 0. A5, of course, is zero. So everything I have written in the slide cancels. Because there is an exact gauge cancellation which is built in in the standard model structure and which guarantees that the standard model satisfies unitarity. In fact, the first contribution comes from the terms I didn't write is order m Higgs square divided by the electroweak scale. A square is a constant and is the constant that at some point will violate unitarity if we don't take into account a higher order of terms. Okay? 
But this again tells you that there is a huge cancellation at the loop level. So again, what is the coupling of the Higgs to two Ws? We now nowadays from LHG, that is the standard model one, within an uncertainty of about 10%. Okay. Is it possible to have a Higgs coupling to WW which differs from the standard model result by 10%? According to LHG, is still possible. According to this calculation, it's impossible. Because if I put A equal 0.9, you plug into this formula and you will see the problems you have. You will have a huge violation of unitarity. So you see that there are strong constraints that you need to take care when you try to build your model of new physics or put in a different way. Imagine that uh, in two months, LHC starts having data and at some point it tells you, no, no, A is not 1, it's 0.9. What that means? Everything is wrong? No. What it means is that if A is 0.9, we are missing some three-level contribution here and some one-loop contribution there, which cancels the additional 0.1 that we don't have in the formula. So any deviations from one in this coupling or in this coupling means that there should be an additional light state which is light, which will be in the lowest order Lagrangian, and which should contribute to this physics. That's why it's so important to measure these couplings, because one thing is correlated with the other one. For instance, which contributions you could have there? Imagine a model with uh, two scalar doublets, if supersymmetry, for instance, or a non-supersymmetric to Higgs doublet model. You have additional scalars, additional neutral scalars, with you can exchange. Okay. Each one of these neutral scalars has a gauge coupling which is smaller than the standard model one. Okay. But it's done in such a way because the model is renormalizable that the strength of the standard model gauge coupling is distributed among all the neutral scalars of the new model. In such a way that once you add all the contributions of all the neutral scalars, you get the same result. The equivalent to put in this formula A equal to 1. Okay? Therefore, deviations from this coupling, tiny deviations, should always be correlated with new physics at light scales. So you can look for the new physics, trying to find directly a new bump in the data, or if you are not lucky and you don't find the bump, you can try to look to WW scattering and see whether the cross-section behaves as we expect, so constant, or it grows. If you see that the cross-section grows more than it should, then you know that there is some state around. Okay? And the question is uh, where to find it. Okay. Let's go now to the ugly part of all this. And the ugly part in the electroweak theory are always the fermions. Okay? Why I say is the ugly part? Because we understand a lot, so we understand basically everything in QCD. We are not able to compute, but this is a technical detail. We understand the, the theory. Okay? We understand the gate sector of the electroweak theory, and now we believe that we start to understand the scalar sector up to some extent. But we understand nothing, really nothing, about flavor. Because flavor in the standard model, you just put the U covers, you have the Higgs mechanism, they generate the masses, you see that the masses generate in a funny way some mixings, and they fit beautifully the data. But uh, where the mixing factors come from, where the different values of the U covers come from, we really don't understand. Okay, so if you try this game, then I can do the same. Let's be completely general. Completely general means I only couple Goldstone, so I forget about the Higgs for a moment. I only have the Goldstones. 
the goldstones are enough to produce the electroweak symmetry breaking, and now I couple the goldstone to the fermions. So, goldstones means a theory which has a global symmetry as u2 left times as u2 right. So, perfect. I take uh, a doublet of quarks and a doublet of leptons, and now my doublets contain both the left part and the right part. That's nice. Because in the standard model, we don't understand why we, we put the right-handed things in singlets. Okay, so it looks more natural. And now we try to build. So I put the left-handed quark doublet, for instance. So it transforms as G left, Q left. The right-handed part, it transforms as G right, Q right. We know that the Goldstones transform as G left, G right dagger. So let's put Q left, U, Q right. That has the right transformation properties. Okay, but we have a problem. Well, let's put first some constant. So the U kava is a coupling constant. Okay. But what is the problem? This does not preserve electric charge. It does not preserve hypercharge. And the standard model, it's very important that it preserves electric charge. And this is based in the U1 hypercharge symmetry group. This means that the u kappa coupling of the standard model, that's why I have put this fake thing which transforms as GR, GR daga. What is that? Well, if I want to do electroweak physics, I can only accept that the, the left-handed up couples with the right-handed up and the left-handed down couples with the right-handed down. Because I need to preserve U1 hypercharge. So I need to break my symmetry precisely in this way. Putting here a matrix which is 1, 0 or which is 0, 1. Once I put the 1, 0 or the 0, 1, this is the up U cover of the standard model and this is the down U cover of the standard model. So U cover couplings are explicit breakings of custodial symmetry. We don't understand much. That's physics. Is what it is. So we need to parameterize that. Second problem. I am discussing everything with one generation. But we have three generations. So there is a flavor structure. Which means that this u kappa coupling is not a coupling. It's a matrix in flavor space that we don't understand. Okay, so let's forget about flavor for the moment, but flavor will always increase our problems. So this is the lowest order Lagrangian in this language, but it's just the Yukawa Lagrangian of the standard model. It's nothing more than that, except that I didn't need to put the Higgs there. Just the Goldstones. Mm -hmm. Now you say, okay, let's write higher order operators with fermions. Because yesterday I only wrote the 15 operators in the bosonic sector, the upper quiz, Longitano Lagrange. Well, we can try with fermions, don't get a scare. Here you have a bunch of operators. You can see that in all operators there is something magenta, which means that all operators break explicitly custodial symmetry, and I have so many because I have so many ways to break custodial symmetry with the fermions, okay, that I have a bunch of operators. But not all the operators are there. This is a second table with more operators that I am allowed to write. Okay? And all that is for a single generation. If you put now flavor in the game, you can be sure that you can write more than 1,000 operators. Okay, which means we have a problem. Okay, so once you touch the fermionic sector, you need to start making assumptions. And better your assumptions uh, rely in some uh, principle which is safe, and the problem is that we don't have too many safe principles in the flavor sector. Okay, so this is completely open to investigation. Okay, you can see many papers trying many things, but always are very simplistic uh, ways to face the problem 
because it's a very hard problem. Okay, but uh, that's not the end because I was not putting the Higgs. That was just Goldstones and fermions. But now we know that the Higgs exists and is a light particle. I should include the Higgs in my Lagrangian. Okay? So, for every single operator I have written, either in the bosonic sector or in the fermionic sector, I can multiply the operator with an arbitrary function of the Higgs. Just an arbitrary polynomial function in powers of uh, Higgs field over vacuum expectation value. Okay. This does not increase the chiral dimension. Remember, the U contains an exponential, which is an expansion in powers of Goldstone over V. But the Higgs is a light particle like the Goldstones. Doesn't in, uh, does not have derivatives, does not increase anything. So for every single operator, you can add an arbitrary function, that means an infinite number of unknown couplings. But also you need to include some scalar potential, which also now there is no reason why to stop at dimension 4. It's a series with unknown coefficients. But you can also include derivatives of the Higgs field. Because now the derivative counts as one power, so uh, there are not so many, but you can include many new operators which are just proportional to the to one derivative. Which means that the game really becomes difficult. So we are completely stuck. You need something to, to make a breakthrough and to go ahead. So we can learn many things in the bosonic sector, and people are doing that. In the flavor sector, things are necessarily much more model dependent. So, which kind of assumptions one could do? So, the assumption that everybody does. Let's assume that the Higgs really comes as a doublet as the standard model predicts. This is an assumption. Okay, an assumption that we would like to test probably is a very reasonable assumption, and it works. So instead of just putting the Goldstones and then adding a singlet scalar fill, you say, no, really the structure is a scalar doublet where the three Goldstones come together with the Higgs fill. In this moment, you have linked the U to the fill H. Now you cannot put arbitrary functions of H because you don't build any more the Lagrangian with you, you build the Lagrangian with the doublet. Okay? And this is called the linear realization of the electroweak theory. But remember, it's not equivalent to the previous thing. Okay? It's just a very particular case of the previous thing, which probably is the right scenario, but uh, we need to prove it. Okay, it's not the most general one. And I can give you many examples of models where this does not apply. For instance, Technicolor. What happens with this scenario? Well, everything becomes easier to compute. Because here, really, you have the lowest order Lagrangian is the standard model. And now you write operators with higher dimensionality in terms of the standard model fields, including the Higgs doublet, with coefficients suppressed set by scales. How many operators do you have in this scenario? Well, the first higher order operator should come at dimension 5. And dimension 5 is beautiful because you can only write one operator which satisfies the standard model symmetries, as you to left times U1 hypercharge. This operator is called the Weimer operator because it's the, the first person who wrote it. It's put there. It violates lepton number by two units. You cannot write this operator with quarks because you will violate hypercharge. So it only exists for leptons. Violets lepton number by two units, therefore it generates a majorana mass for the left-handed neutrinos. You don't you didn't put any right-handed neutrino. It's not in the standard model. 
is not a light field in this framework. Okay, so independently of whether right-handed neutrinos exist or not exist, you generate a Majorana mass term for the neutrinos. And in addition, it comes in dimension 5, so you predict is the first signal of new physics you are supposed to see. And it's what we have measured. We have measured neutrino masses. Okay? If you take the measured neutrino masses and you fit the values of the measured neutrino masses to this operator, you can guess what's the size of this scale. Okay? What you measure will be lambda divided by the coupling. Surprise, you fit the neutrino masses and you find the lambda is of the order of the grand unification scale, 10 to the 14 GeV. Which on one side is beautiful, then you learn the neutrino <coughs> masses are correlated probably with the grand unification scale, which is very high. On the other hand, it tells you that better the rest of the operators have nothing to do with this scale, because otherwise you don't, will not see any new physics for many years. Okay? So then, what everybody does is say, okay, neutrino physics has something to do with a high scale, let's forget about neutrinos, okay? and let's assume that the rest of the operators are linked to some scale which is closer to us, which is around the 1 TV, Okay, and therefore, we need to go to the dimension 6 operators. If you go to the dimension 6 operators, the basis was written by Buchmuller and Wheeler 20, 25 years ago. It is a basis which for one generation contains of the order of 80 different operators. And people have been working and playing with this basis for many years until this group of Polish people, just uh, four or five years ago, th they did make the effort to check whether that was a consistent basis or not. Okay? And they were able to prove that of the 80 operators, at least 20 of them were linearly dependent. There were relations, so it was a completely redundant basis. And they have managed to prove that at least you can reduce it to 59. Okay, which is already a, a quite a good progress. Whether the real number is 59 or in two years somebody else will find some algebraic relation that will eliminate one additional operator, nobody knows. Okay, but you need to work with 59 operators. The only thing you are assuming is that you preserve baryon and lepton number. If you allow for violations of baryon and lepton number, because this is just an accidental global symmetry in the standard model, there are five operators more, which were written by Weinberg, Wilczek, and C, and Abbott and Weiss many years ago. So it's nice. You can study separately the physics of uh, baryon and lepton number violation and the more normal physics. But the number of operators is huge. 59, but okay, you can still work with 59. But this counting of operators is forgetting about flavor. Just one generation. Okay? If you take into account that there are three generations and to all these operators, you allow them to have flavor quantum numbers, first generation, second generation, third generation, between... Uh, Operators which preserve B and L and operators which violate B and L, adding them together, there are close to 3,000 operators. There are about uh, 1,600 which preserve B and L and about uh, 1,200 or something like that which violate B and L. Which tells you again that even in this simplified scenario, you have a problem with flavor. So the real problem that we need to face is flavor, and we are lacking good, uh, good ideas. Okay, if you try to read papers, you will get completely confused. You will get confused. Okay, let me show just first the basis of the Polish people with, of the 59 operators so that you have a, a feeling of how they look like for one generation. 
So every time you see a fermion, you can start putting Fraybo quantum numbers and you increase. So this table is without four fermion operators. This table is with four fermion operators. So you have the, the 59 operators, all of them there. Okay. Well, this is one basis. But if you start reading papers, you will discover first, everybody avoids flavor. You understand why. Second, there are terrible fights about groups, and the fight is always of the same type. My basis is better than your basis. Okay. So, what everybody is trying to do, you want to analyze some physics, you don't want to fit uh, too many coefficients, so you want to try to simplify as much as possible your basis, so that you can do some physics. So, you argue that uh, in my basis I am just fitting the operators that are really relevant, for instance, to measure the gauge self-coupling, so to measure the gauge self-energies or whatever. So, those are three different bases. Without looking to the details of the operators, okay, maybe the notation is a little bit different, but uh, it's the same physics, but there is something that should surprise you immediately, the number of operators is different. It's not slightly different. It's very different. Why? Because in, no, in this basis, for instance, nobody has written any fermion operator. Using equations of motion, you can always translate operators from the bosonic sector to the fermionic sector. So the three bases are right but they will differ in the number of operators they will have in the fermionic sector. So, uh, you cannot really argue that you are doing the relevant physics if you don't show the complete basis. Of course, they are doing analysis which is a right, that makes sense, but if <coughs> this basis is able to fit the data properly and rigorously with seven operators, while this one users of the order of 12 or 15, that means that here you are going to find many redundancies. And you are going to find that you don't fit just the coupling of one operator, you always fit the same combination of couplings of several operators. But uh, if you read the papers, the problem is that you need to invest a lot of time in the formalism to learn the notation they are using before you start understanding the physics. The physics is very simple. For instance, this is a, just a phenomenological parametrization of uh, cubic couplings between three gauge bosons, W, Z, and photons. And you just put parameters, G1, K, lambda. There are three parameters when B is a photon, three parameters when V is a set, six parameters. And now you look in the different bases, in one basis with, you have three operators which describe that, in another basis you have five, in another basis you have six. But all the bases are describing the same physics. What you really find is that in any base, what you predict is a relation between parameters, independently of the operators you are using. Okay. So, the only content of your operators, if you reduce your analysis to this type of physics, is that the lambda coupling for the photon is equal to the lambda coupling of the Z, and there is a relation between this G1 and this K for the Z and the photon. So, the physics should be independent on your conventions and your formulas. And then you can make fits, and you get very satisfied, and for instance, what this formalism does is linear sigma model. The Higgs is part of a doublet together with the Goldstones. Okay. What that means is that the physics of three longitudinal Ws is linked to the physics of a Higgs and two Ws. Okay. Which in the general formalism is not. Which means that in any basis you use, that's uh, not important to analyze that, once you have put the Higgs and the Goldstones in the same doublet, you can fit your couplings either with lab data, 
without any hits. So you are just using data on the couplings of the Zs and Ws or with LHC data that you are looking for experimental information from Higgs going to two Ws or Higgs going to two Zs. And of course, nowadays, everything is consistent. You get some bounds, but precision is still too low for that to become relevant. So we are just starting the game. Some people have been working more and they have uh, taken not a full basis of operators, but uh, more operators, which you argue the, those are the most important ones for the things we are fitting now. And then you start to make a global fit and you get plots of this type. Don't look into the detail. So you are bounding with all the data is available at the moment, the couplings of those operators. And what do you find? Everything is consistent with zero because the standard model is working within some uncertainty, which unfortunately is still large. So at the moment, this is not very relevant. This type of game could become very, very, very relevant in the moment anybody identifies a real signal beyond the standard model, which is not necessarily a bump simply some deviation, okay? So let me stop here the analysis of the electroweak theory because unfortunately there is no data so things are still not interesting. And let me try to answer the question. What uh, we could have, which scenario we could be living in in three, four, five years if we are more successful and we find a signal. Hmm? Of course, if LHC finds clear bumps and we discover particles, okay, then you will do something better than that. Okay, because then you will check explicit models with these bumps with these new particles. But if LHC only finds a small deviations of a standard model physics without a clear bump, then we will be forced to do this type of analysis we will be forced to handle as many operators as needed and working with 15 operators or working with 16 or working with 2000 makes a difference. So we need uh, clever simplifying assumptions which allow us to make progress. So let's... Okay, this one. Let me try to address the question and I will be very, very brief here, just to give a flavor, so don't get lost by formalists, of which information these low energy constants could have on high scales. That's what we are interested in. Okay? If you see a tiny deviation somewhere, and you identify that the tiny deviation appears in the operator number 12, what it means? Okay? Of course, if you only identify one operator, there is not much that you can do. But if you identify that there is a discrepancy in operator number 12, there is another discrepancy in the operator number 10, they are of the same size and with different signs. And then operator number 5 has a small discrepancy, which is one-fifth of the previous one with a given sign. This is a lot of information. Because then immediately you can start asking, okay, which kind of underlying dynamics is going to generate this pattern? But if you think about the Fermi theory of weak interactions, the Fermi theory of weak interactions didn't work the way you have learned it. The, the way things worked were uh, Dirac made his... Uh, direct uh, formalist to describe a spin one half particles okay and then immediately somebody wrote all the possible four fermion operators which could describe muon decay or neutron decay at that time okay so what you can write a bunch of operators with four fermions because you have an initial neutron muon which decays into three fermions okay, so you put your four direct fields and you write all possible operators with all possible direct structures which are Lorentz invariant 
That means scalar, pseudo scalar, vector, axial, or tensor. The Dirac invariance. Okay, the bilineals. And you know that they are dimension 6, so that the couplings have a dimension 1 over lambda squared. And now you start fitting data. So you can fit the angular distribution in neutron decay. The energy distribution on neutron decay is easier if you think about muons and you don't have hadrons. So you have muon decay to electron. So you measure the electron direction, the electron energy, the electron polarization. If you manage to have muons polarized, you measure the distribution for a muon with one polarization or for a muon with another polarization. And when you add all this data, you prove that all the coefficients of your operators are consistent with zero, except one. The one which is an interaction vector minus axial. So you prove that the weak interaction is a left-handed charge current interaction. Okay. Once you have proved that this is the operator, you measure the muon lifetime, you measure the strength of the operator, the Fermi coupling constant, and you discover that the scale of the interaction is 100 GeV. So you discover that there is an electroweak scale, but that there should be some particle at that scale. So this is effective field theory game. Okay? It's not that we understand muon decay because we understand the standard model. It's just the opposite. We have discovered the standard model doing effective field theory with the muon and, and neutron decay. Okay? And now we are in the same situation. But of course, uh, life is more harder now. It's the only difference. Okay? So this is the kind of game I would like to address. But in order to address the game, I will go back to QCD because there I know the effective theory, I know the underlying theory, and I can play games. Okay? So, imagine the following thing. So, forget for a moment about electroweak interactions. It's QCD. In QCD, we know that there are six quarks and gluons. But there are six quarks at the electroweak scale because the top is very heavy. We know perturbation theory. We know something called the renormalization group, the operator product expansion. So, there are many techniques of quantum field theory which allow us to go from the W scale to the charm mass scale and integrate out the heavy fields, eliminate the top, the bottom, and the charm. And we know how to do that, and we know what we get. We get an effective theory with three quarks and gluons, and this effective theory is called QCD with three flavors. Okay, but it's a different QCD. Of course, if you put electroweak interactions, you also know here all the four fermion operators which give electroweak interactions at low energy. But let's forget. Now, we have seen that at very low energies, we have Goldstone physics, and we know that the strong interactions are given in terms of Goldstones. So we are able to build an effective field theory which only contains Goldstones, pions, kaons, and itas. And this is chiral perturbation theory with three flavors. But of course, if I go to even lower energies, the pi on mass scale, I can throw away the strange quark, which means I can throw away the kaons and the itas, and build a different effective field theory, which is chiral perturbation theory with two flavors, SU2 times SU2. And of course, I know how to go from this theory to this theory exactly. Because I have this theory, I integrate out from the generating functional the Keon field, and I predict the couplings of this theory in terms of the couplings of this theory. That's easy. What I don't know how to do is to go from QCD with three flavors to chiral perturbation theory with three flavors. I don't know how to do that because we didn't solve the QCD Lagrangian. So we need something. So there is a lot of work here. So once you discretize space-time, you put the QCD Lagrangian on a computer, and you do lattice simulations. That's one way. Okay, brute force. The other way, you look for 
well-defined approximations within QCD. And a well-defined approximation is QCD simplifies a lot in the limit where instead of taking three colors, you take infinite number of colors. Okay, we didn't solve that theory, but it's a much more reasonable theory from the technical point of view, and we know many things. And then you can make an expansion. Instead of expanding in the QCD coupling, you expand in powers of 1 over 3. 1 over the number of colors. Okay, the first thing, the time that you think about that, you say it's expanding about 1 over 3 is crazy. But if you put the loop factors 1 over 4 pi times 1 over 3, you discover that that's of the order of the electromagnetic coupling. So it's not so crazy. And when you start analyzing data, you really see that it works. So you have a well-defined expansion with which you can do things. And with this expansion, you can really bridge in many ways that and learn many things. Some of them work beautifully, some of them don't, and then you try to learn why not, and you learn always some dynamics. Or you can do something in the middle, but of course at some point you will use everything you can, and it's okay. With QCD with three light flavors, since the strong coupling is not so strong, I can really try to go to energies of the order of 1.5, 1.6 GeV, and perturbation theory still seems to work. In the effective theory with Goldstone bosons, I cannot go above uh, the Romas because I am clearly missing hadronic states. But why not adding the lowest lying resonances, the rho, the A1, the resonances that lie around 1 GB or between 1 and 1.5 GB, and you try to build a different theory, a different effective theory, which contains Goldstone plus resonances. Okay. What can you impose on this theory? You can impose that it satisfies chiral symmetry. Okay. And then you bridge this theory with this one. You know many properties of this theory, so you can make a link in this direction. But if you have the first few resonance multiplets, you can reach with this theory up to 1.5 GeV. And at 1.5 GeV, short distance QCD, is working within some uncertainty, okay? And we are not worrying now about 1% uncertainties. We just want to understand qualitatively what is going on. So if you can go up to 1.5 GB, you can do a matching between this theory and this theory. What means a matching? Take any green function that you can imagine. You analyze how this green function behaves in short distance QCD how it grows with energy, or how it falls down with energy, and you impose this behavior in the same green function in the effective theory. And imposing this short distance behavior, you are imposing conditions on the low energy couplings of your effective theory. And if you impose an enough number of conditions, you are going to frozen your effective theory and you are going to predict the couplings. Okay? So the question is, how this works? Well, in order to make that work, I need, unfortunately, some uh, mathematics, because the first thing I need is, I want to couple the rho multiplet to the Goldstones. How the rho multiplet transforms on the chiral symmetry? We know how it transforms under the true isospin is a triplet, or under the true SU3 group is an octet, but not how it transforms under SU2 left times SU2 right, or SU3 left times SU3 right. So we need to do some mathematics or some group theory. So let me introduce the language. You have a group, which is a chiral group. It has a left sector and a right sector, left and right. It's broken to some diagonal subgroup. Let's call it H. What are the Goldstones? The Goldstones are fields which point in the directions of the flat direction. Remember, your vacuum is invariant under H. Your spectrum is invariant under H, under isospin. 
But the gallstones go from one vacuum to another vacuum. Go along the broken, broken directions. So let's imagine that this graph are just the set of all members of the symmetry group G, the full symmetry group. The vertical direction is H, isospin. So what it is every vertical line? A cosette in G over H. Remember what are the equivalent classes of uh, the structure G over H? You take any element of the group G, if you multiply by any element of the subgroup H, you move in this direction and you go to a different member of the group which is equivalent. Why it is equivalent? Because isospin H is a true symmetry group of your spectrum, so any point along any vertical line is equivalent to any other point. What are the gallstones? Remember, the gallstones, I have parameterized my gallstone fields as something like that. Uh, for instance, what I, I am using, the generators of the group, so I am using an element of the group to parameterize the gallstone excitations. Okay. But which member of the group I have chosen? A member that really goes from one vacuum to another vacuum. What I have done is I have taken a representative of every cosette. Gallstones live in the cosette space. For every cosette G over H, I have taken some variables which parameterize my gallstone excitation. And there is are an infinite number of ways which I can choose to do that, and all of them are mathematically equivalent. When I transform a gallstone, I am changing from here to here. I am changing cosine. So the only thing you should have in mind, and then you just believe me and we don't lose tam time with the mathematics, is we have chosen some particular set of coordinates, which means I have taken a canonical representative of all these cosette space in order to parameterize my gallstones. Okay. It doesn't matter which one I have chosen. I choose one. Now I take, that means I have taken this element of the group to represent this gallstone field. I could have taken any other element of the group which is along the vertical direction. Now I make a group transformation over this gallstone field and I will go somewhere. Somewhere means I have changed from this equivalence class to this equivalent class. So I am changing from this Goldstone field to this Goldstone field. But I am off of my cosette representative. So I need a compensating transformation which belongs to H to come back to my cosette representative. So what I am doing is that I have a chiral group. I have chosen some coordinates to represent the gallstones, which have a left part and a right part, is this. Now I do any transformation of the group, which contains a left part and a right part. I go here, and I need a compensating thing, which will be very complicated, will depend on the gallstone, will depend on G, but which is the same in the left part and the right side. Okay? Because H is the diagonal group. Okay, why introduce all these complications? I didn't introduce this complication the other day. I didn't introduce this complication because I was using that. I have represented the Goldstone fields by my U, which is the product of this times the complex conjugate of that. This transforms as G right, G left dagger, and this is much more natural. So I, I could show you my language without all this ugly geometric uh, thing. Okay, here you need to think in terms of mathematics. Okay. But why I go back here to this notation? Because I want to introduce a row, a resonance. A resonance is something which is, is a triplet and the isospin 
or is an octet and the SU3. So I know how it transforms and the, the group which really matters in the spectrum, H. So I know how it transforms under this transformation H. Which means that if I change language, I can say, when I transform my gallstones with any chiral transformation, GL and G right, this will induce a transformation in the true symmetry group of the vacuum, and I know how my resonance is transformed. So, I will make this canonical choice to simplify things. I take the same coordinates in the right and in the left up to a complex conjugate. So, the only difference is that instead of the big U, I will be using a small U that is the square root. It's not a big change. But, you put it here, this small U transforms this way, there is this compensating thing, and with this compensating thing, I can really build objects. So, it transforms that way. Now I can build structures which transform as SU2 triplets or SU3 octets, and those are the resonances. Of course, my goldstone fields by external sources, I can also put them in this language. Okay? And the lowest order Lagrangian, it looks completely different, but it's the same Lagrangian. It's just ugly notation. Okay? So since this is notation, I will not uh, bother to explain anything more about that. If anybody needs it, I can give you references where to find notation. All that was introduced by Callan, Coleman, West, and Sumino many, many years ago. They like it, uh, mathematics a lot. Okay? The only important thing is that this gives me a prescription how to couple goldstones to massive states, to resonances. What I can do with this prescription? Something very simple. Right? Just an effective Lagrangian which is chiral invariant and which couples everybody. A vector multiplet an axial multiplet, a scalar multiplet, a pseudo-scalar multiplet, to my goldstones and uh, sources. There will be couplings, which I can fix, for instance, measuring rho to 2 pi, a1 to 3 pi, the coupling of the rho to the photon, so I can measure those couplings at a higher scale. Once I have measured those couplings, I can do that. I integrate out these resonance states. So, you measure the coupling of the rho to two pions. But now you exchange the rho, you generate a low energy coupling with four pions. That could be the coupling of a top and t top to a vector resonance at the one TV scale that we still don't know. Okay? And the only thing you see at very low energies is an effective coupling of four tops. It's the same in QCD. Here is, this is a current, so you have a photon, the photon couples to the rho. We have measured this coupling experimentally. So if I know the coupling of the rho to one photon and the coupling of the rho to two pions, I can compute the effective coupling of the photon to two pions. Okay? And I can do that for vectors and for axials, for scalars and pseudoscalars. And then the question is, which predictions I get, how they compare with the experiment, what I learn with that. Okay, let's stop five minutes, otherwise I will not show any more mathematical language. That was just to impress you that there is some mathematics that you can use and everything is mathematically perfectly well defined. But the picture you should keep in mind is the trivial thing. You exchange a resonance and you get a low energy coupling among light states. Okay? I will show to you how it works in QCD. And then the question is what can we do in the electroweak sector to learn something similar? Okay, let's so, stop. So you integrate the resonance and then you integrate it out? Huh? Yes. The difference is that in QCD, I have measured those resonances 
So I know there are couplings from experiment. In the electrobic sector, I know nothing. And that, that's a slight difference. Okay, let's try to continue. I have shown you some language, so don't get scared about the mathematical language. You just learn the mathematics when you need. Okay, and here what we needed is a well-defined prescription to couple massive states from the physical spectrum. And the spectrum is an spectrum invariant under the group H, so massive states are in well-defined representations of the group H. Okay. And we need a language to couple these massive states to the Goldstones. And the Goldstones are objects that we have generated with the big group G. So this uh, Callan, Coleman, West and Sumino formalism just tells us how to couple in a rigorously way Goldstones and massive states in any theory. Okay, once you learn how to do that, then it's just a game. You have all the objects of your effective Lagrangian. My effective Lagrangian now contains Goldstones, external sources, so photons, Ws, Zs, whatever, okay? and massive states with given transformations under the true symmetry group of the spectrum of the body. And now you write, the lowest order Lagrangian, lowest order means in the chiral sense, in derivatives of the Goldstone fields and external sources, which couples to your massive states. And to simplify things, I have only put couplings to a single massive state. It's the simplest possibility. So I see here one, two, three, four, five, six couplings. So I need six experimental measurements in the resonance region. So since we know the rho, we know the A1, we know the scalar resonances and things like that, we know something about these couplings. Now, you integrate these heavy resonances out from your effective theory. So you go from the resonance effective theory to chiral perturbation theory, where only the Goldstones are there. So this is equivalent in a diagrammatic way to exchange the heavy states. Okay. Across means an external source. Okay. Lex means uh, Goldstone Lex, pions. So this exchange gives you a local interaction of four Goldstones. This exchange gives you a local interaction of one external source and two Goldstones. This will give you a contact term with two external sources and no Goldstones. This Exactly the same thing, but this comes from vector exchange, this comes from axial exchange. And you do the same, exchanging the scalar and pseudo-scalar resonances. Everything is chiral invariant, so you are going to get chiral invariant operators. So you are going to get the operators of chiral perturbation theory with low energy constants, which are completely fixed in terms of the constants of the high energy theory. So what do you get? That's the result. Remember, in chiral perturbation theory, at order p to the 4, I had 10 low energy constants, so I get predictions for all of them, and I have allowed to put an exchange of as many massive resonances as you would like to have. Of course, I will analyze things with a single resonance exchange, okay, but a priori you could add an infinite number of them. In fact, in QCD, you can take this pattern more, even more seriously because is it possible to prove rigorously, mathematically, that in the limit of an infinite number of colors, QCD is a three-level quantum field theory of hadrons. So you can change the QCD description in terms of quarks and gluons by a QCD description in terms of a tower of uh, hadrons, which are stable, they don't decay, they are vectors, axials, scalars, pseudoscalar with given numbers, but there are an infinite number of them. So, if you want, those are predictions 
real predictions of QCD in the limit of a large number of covers. And of course you can see that some couplings are not there, which means that these couplings you predict that in the limit of an infinite number of colors are just zero. And this is a rigorous prediction. While some others you predict that there are relations among them. So you are learning something already. In fact, you predict that those things are zero. It's also possible to predict uh, I will not enter into that. The eta prime is a very special object in QCD because there is an anomaly. So it should be a Goldstone, but it's not a Goldstone. It's a very heavy object. Okay? And with the mass of this object, you can predict one of the couplings. Don't, don't enter into that. Okay, and not into that. What else we can do? This is matching between my effective theory with Goldstones and massive state and my effective theory with only Goldstones. Let's try now to do the opposite matching. The matching between real QCD and my effective theory with massive states. How can I do this matching? Look into green functions. For instance, imagine that I try to compute the electromagnetic form factor of the pions. So this is a photon, an electromagnetic current couples to two pions. In my effective theory, is a trivial calculation at three level. Is the lowest order coupling is one. This is just what the chiral perturbation theory has at lowest order. If I include my resonances, I get coupling of the photon to the rho, coupling of the rho to two pions, and the rho propagator. Okay? And I exchange an infinite number of things. If you want, for I get this result. But QCD tells me that at very large energies, this form factor should fall down to zero. You can prove that in QCD. But of course, if QCD, perturbative QCD, is working already fine at 1.52 GeV, and it does within a 10%, 20%, okay, at 1.5 GeV, you should get this behavior already. So, you need to impose that this form factor in terms of resonance satisfies that. This tells you this equality. Because this is one, this goes to constant. Okay, in the at large t, this is minus one. So, one minus the sum of these couplings should be zero, so you get this constraint. If you work in the approximation that you put a single vector resonance, you are fixing the product of the two couplings in terms of the pion decay constant. So F is the coupling of the resonance to two pions, G is the cup sorry, G is the coupling of the resonance to two pions, F is the coupling of the resonance to the photon. And once you understand that, you can play with many other things. For instance, you can take a left current and a right current. They have the opposite chirality. If you compute the two-point function of a left and a right current, in perturbation theory, this is exactly zero to all orders. Because you need to break chiral symmetry in order to get something different from zero. Okay? This is true if you don't take into account quark masses. So you can break chiral symmetry putting quark masses, or non-perturbatively, saying my QCD vacuum breaks chiral symmetry. Everything is based in this breaking. So you need some operator which breaks chiral symmetry in order to get something different from zero. Okay, but if you analyze which operators break chiral symmetry and can contribute here, okay, you need some operator which is invariant under H, but which is not invariant under G in order to get a contribution to this two-point function. Those are called order parameters of electroweak symmetry breaking. So, the f in order to have such a contribution, you need to go to operators of dimension 6 at least. Which means, 
that in QCD, and this is general for any asymptotically free theories, you prove that uh, the limit of this object, this correlator, times S squared, when S goes to infinity, is zero. Which means that this object falls down at infinity at least like 1 over S to the cube. Is a very, very convergent object because it violates chiral symmetry. Mm -hmm. You will never get such a behavior in perturbation theory. In perturbation theory, you get locks. So it's zero in perturbation theory. Well, this was uh, advocated by Weinberg many years before QCD existed using arguments of chiral symmetry. So he proved that any theory of strong interactions which was going to be reasonable and should explain data, should satisfy this behavior. And therefore, he wrote uh, implications of that, which are called the Weinberg sum rules, and which are valid for any asymptotically free theory. So don't lose time into that. Let's analyze things more easily. You take a left current, you take a right current, and you try to compute with your Lagrangian. Which kind of contributions you can get? A Goldstone exchange, that's what you get, F squared divided by S. Or a vector exchange, you get that, or an axial exchange, you get that. Okay? This is a three level calculation. And you, again, if you only put, put one resonance exchange, it's simpler. If not, you want just an infinite sum. But now you know that this object should fall like 1 over S to the cube. But this goes like 1 over s. That should be an exact cancellation. So the things that in the large, at large s, this goes like f square, this as minus f square, this as minus f square. Okay? So you need to impose this equality because this should be 0. But now you expand, Tyler expand the next term that goes like 1 over s squared. How? You expand these propagators in powers of m squared divided by s, and the next term should also cancel. So you get two conditions. Okay? So you are getting conditions among your couplings. Once you understand the, the rules of the game, okay, if you take, for instance, you take these conditions and you assume, okay, let's put just a single resonance because the resonance of lower mass is going to dominate my physics. Okay? So these two conditions already give you this type of relations. You can predict the coupling of the rho to the photon in terms of the mass of the rho, the mass of the first axial resonance, and the vacuum expectation value, this is f pi in the case of QCD. So this is a very strong prediction. You also predict that the mass of the first axial meson is larger than the mass of the rho. And it is larger. So you start understanding problems, so properties of the hadrons you measure in terms of short distance properties of QCD, which is nice. Okay, but this is QCD, but the Weinberg sum rules are valid in any asymptotically free theory, so I can apply that to Technicolor. Or I can even try to figure out how things get modified in non-asymptotically free theories. Okay, so my conditions are not as strong, but there are conditions. So there is a lot of games I can do. Let's follow. Here you have... Uh, a selection of more constraints. We have seen this one, the electromagnetic form factor of the pion. These ones are the Weinberg sum rules. This is another constraint that you can extract from the axial form factor of the pion, so the coupling of a pion on a photon to the axial current, to a W. Or you can play with the k pi scalar form factor, or with things similar to the Weinberg sum rules, but for a scalar pseudo scalar resonances and blah, blah. You can go on adding green functions. There are an infinite number of them. 
So there are many things you can get. So let's simplify things. Which type of relations I am getting? Because remember, exchanging resonances, I got predictions for the low energy couplings in terms of resonance couplings and resonance buses. That was the matching between my resonance theory and chiral perturbation theory. Now I have done a different matching, that's what you were asking me before, between QCD and my resonance theory within some approximations. I was working at three level. Okay. So let's put the things together. Let's simplify and let's assume that I only use one resonance of each type with the argument that since every single contribution is suppressed by one over the resonance mass square, the most important thing is the first resonance I, I find. Okay. So, you predict all couplings in terms of the raw mass, the scalar mass, and F pi. You even predict relations between masses, resonance masses, and then you get a definite pattern of low energy couplings. If you add some additional input, and I will not enter into this additional input, because you can get it from many different sources, and surprisingly you always finish with the same prediction. For instance, you can use the, the U1 anomaly, pi 0 going to two, or pi 0 going to 2 photons, the, the non-abelian anomaly. You can predict pi zero going to two photons in QCD. And this relates low energy things to very high energy things, ultraviolet. Or you can play with some additional green functions. You find more relations and you are able to fix everything in terms of the number of colors. Okay. Of course, you are able to do this strong prediction because we know many properties of QCD. But many of these properties will be valid in a technical or like theory also. Now the question is how this works. And one will expect that, okay, you get something that maybe is not too unreasonable, but this cannot work. Okay, let's see. Those are the values of the low energy couplings renormalized at the raw mass in units of 10 to the minus 3, obtained many years ago by Gaster and Lloyd Biller, analyzing hadronic physics with the chiral Lagrangian at order p to the 4 only. Now you see the predictions of vector exchange, axial exchange, scalar exchange, and in the pseudo scalar sector I have only taken the eta prime exchange just goes to this coupling. It's the only contribution to this coupling and is right in the center. Okay. But now you look to the other ones and remember when we analyze the pattern of couplings, these two were especially large. This one just comes from the row. You predict, well, in this case this is an input. That's why you predict the value. Okay? So I need some input to fix some parameters. So here, I am not using any short distance condition. So I am using this to measure one of the couplings of the row, the one of the row to one photon, for instance. That's why it's an input. Okay? And once I have measured that, I predict those. Right on top of the numbers. Okay. In the scalar exchange, this is an input, this is an input, because I don't know so many scalar properties, so I get something which is fine, because I have forced it to be fine. But you already at this level, you understand which couplings are dominated by vector exchange, which couplings are dominated by axial exchange, by scalar exchange and pseudo-scalar exchange. So you can link information. And you understand that the two couplings which are really large are the ones which are related to vectors and to axials. The row dominates everything 
In the moment you put an axial, an axial does not contribute to any coupling except to this one. And what it does is cancels the row contribution and that's why it gets small. Okay? Let's add short distance information. Now I use my matching with short distance QCD. And now there are no longer inputs. All the numbers here are written in terms of F pi the raw mass and some scalar mass around 1 GB. Those are my three inputs. You see the numbers. Maybe they are not as good as the previous one because here I was using three inputs, but the pattern is exact. So I understand the low energy couplings of QCD in terms of resonance dynamics. But if now I put and I also understand the zeros, by the way. This is zero. This is zero. I, I understand why. Okay, they are suppressed in the large MC limit. They don't get any resonance exchange contribution. Let's put the additional short distance inputs. So remember, I had a prediction with some additional input where I don't have any free parameter. Everything is fixed in terms of the number of colors, which is 3 and 192 pi square. How this works? It's perfect. Of course, there are deviations. There are discrepancies, okay, within the uncertainties are fine, so, but even there could be an uncertainties or deviations of the order of 30%. In fact, my problem is that, it's that it works too well because I am missing inputs. Okay. So what this tells us, that really low energy physics is dominated by two things. One is Goldstone dynamics, chiral loops, locks, absorptive contributions, the pion dynamics is very important. Second, the dynamics, which is not Goldstone dynamics, a low energy is dominated by the low-lying resonance exchanges. And once we understand the resonance exchanges, we understand the pattern of the low energy couplings. So now you can ask the question in the opposite way. If one day we are able to measure low energy couplings in the electroweak sector, and we find something, the pattern of the something will be telling us about the quantum numbers of the objects that we don't see and which are nearby. So that's the, the kind of game that uh, one would like to have. Okay, since this is QCD, let me show more things, because in QCD we, we have lattice. And lattice means that you can put QCD in the computer. Ten years ago it was impossible to do that, but now computers are so powerful that you can compute the low energy couplings of QCD with a computer. Okay. And this is L4, which is consistent with zero. So those are lattice simulations with two plus one flavor and two plus one plus one flavor. So they are getting more and more precise. This is what you get in chiral perturbation from data at order p to the four. This is what you get more recently at order p to the six. You can see that you didn't decrease the uncertainty, so you you have some other problems. But this is around zero. The computer tells you that it's zero. This is L5, which is clearly different from zero. Here, order P to the C, chiral perturbation theory allows to improve a lot. This is the computer. Things are fine. L6, L8, okay. 2L6 minus L4, that this is uh, predicted to be zero with large uncertainties, is zero. 2L8 minus L5, which is predicted to be zero, is zero. Or if you go to the SU2 theory, now I am putting the pi on decay constant, what you get from data, what you get from the lattice. Or here, the quark condensate. I was telling you, I will assume that the chiral symmetry breaking is due to a quark condensate. But I cannot prove it just using symmetry. It's a dynamical question. Well, but I can compute the quark condensate in the lattice. 
Okay? I get a very consistent pattern. It's different from zero. So it's a non-perturbative object. And it has the size needed to understand the hadronic data. Okay? So we know a lot. Okay. Those are small L's, means low energy couplings of SU2 chiral perturbation theory. Instead of 10, there are 7. You do the same game. So, and everything fits. So, what this is telling us? In QCD, we know the underlying theory. We know the effective theory. So, we can link both things. We can bridge them. The effective theory is useful because we are able to dig into the non-perturbative regime and make predictions. But then it's also useful because using chiral symmetry, we can help the numerical simulations with real QCD, which otherwise will be impossible. And then the lattice people, they don't need to compute pi pi scattering, which is very difficult in the lattice. The only thing they need to compute is a low energy constant. Okay. And we have a, a clear pattern that we understand things. So, can we do something similar in the electroweak cycle? There are plenty of lattice groups making simulations in the electroweak sector, assuming some technical or like theory or whatever. So, this kind of effort is being done. We have the electroweak effective Lagrangian in the weak sector. The problem is that it has far too many low energy constants. So, we will never be able to fix from data 3,000 low energy couplings. Never. So, we need approximations. We need uh, uh, to study kinds of models with some general properties. Which general properties could be? For instance, what is the ultraviolet behavior that is allowed for a short distance theory? It should be an asymptotically free theory. Or it should be something else. This gives you short distance conditions. So, can we analyze with given short distance conditions which patterns of low energy constants one should expect? And then, if we see any signal in experiment, can we link this signal with underlying theories? Okay, so the game is very similar. So, what are you supposed to do? Theories which are strongly coupled, technicolor, walking technicolor, or theories of this light, they always predict towers of massive states. They are very similar to QCD. Okay? So there are infinite towers of resonances. The low energy constants of the electroweak effective theory should be dominated by the first resonances which appear in those towers. It's the same. Simply, the underlying theory, we know it will not be QCD-like. It will be something else. But uh, we need to analyze. So, you can do the same program. You build an effective field theory in the electroweak sector, which couples goldstones and resonances, and you build this theory at the lowest possible order, like I have done before in the chiral Lagrangian. You try... Once you have this theory, you identify the couplings, you require a good ultraviolet behavior, so your dynamical assumptions will be there. Okay? What uh, you believe is a good ultraviolet behavior from some underlying theory in the electroweak sector. In QCD, I know. Here, I don't know. I need to guess. Okay? But it's easier to, to guess this property than not to guess which exact theory I have. Then I match the two Lagrangians, and matching the two Lagrangians, I get the low energy constants in the electroweak sector. Okay, so the program works in QCD, but in QCD we have many more handles, so we know what we are doing. In the electroweak sector, you are just uh, moving in the dark and trying not to make terrible mistakes. But it, a priori is the same. So let me just show an example. It's the same Lagrangian as before. Okay. I have just simplified. I have taken a few terms. By now, S1 is the Higgs, a singlet under the electroweak sector. My U's are uh, Goldstone fields, or longitudinal W's. V and A are 
a heavy vector and axial electroweak state. And F plus and F minus, they contain couplings to the normal Ws, to the photons, etc., to the transverse uh, gauge polarization. So, don't look into the details. Now you do resonance exchange. What do you predict? The couplings of the Appelquist Longitano Lagrangian. Of course, you predict these couplings in terms of the couplings of your heavy states that you don't know. So, if you are able to measure these couplings and prove that some of them is different from zero, you go to this table and you look, okay, if you get precisely these couplings, one, four, five, two, and three, and in addition, you prove that A4 and A5 have simil similar size and opposite sign, you can be sure that there is a vector resonance at some point with a mass which is not very far from you. Okay? But if now you impose short distance conditions, so I have imposed an asymptotically free theory. I get that. Now V is 246 GB is the electroweak scale. So this tells me that if I have an asymptotically free theory, I should get non-zero values of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 with a size which is regulated by the vector mass. In addition, I can prove that the vector mass is lower than the axial mass, exactly as in QCD. Are you assuming anything about the, uh, the global symmetry breaking pattern? Uh, no, here I am in the gauge scalar sector. I didn't touch fermions. So I don't need to make any assumption. So my only assumption is as you to left times as you to right breaks to as you to left plus right. So my Lagrangian is the Applequist uh, 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 Longitano Lagrangian. Okay. My second assumption is the underlying theory is an asymptotically free theory, but I don't know which theory it is. Then these predictions are immediate. Of course, you can predict many more things. And we are doing that. That's a fact. Chimo is getting crazy computing many and many low energy couplings. Okay? So, you are looking into the dark. You don't know the underlying theory. But at least you can make a systematics which will allow you to organize results in case you see any signal without a clear bump. So, it's useful. Okay, I will stop because it's already too late. So let me finish. Let me emphasize that effective field theory is not a goal. Okay, so you should not aim to learn and work for effective field theory. Effective field theory is a tool. But it's a very useful tool which you can apply to any possible physical system provided this physical system has a gap. So what you need to do is identify gaps, classify your states as heavy and light, okay? And if you manage to do that immediately, make an expansion around zero mass for the light objects, make an expansion about around infinite mass for the heavy objects, and you are in business. Okay? And then you can classify things without assuming any dynamics. In order for that to work, you need symmetries, otherwise you have too many things. Okay? If you have many symmetries, your effective theory will be highly constrained and you will make many predictions. Where the problems appear, the problems appear in the symmetry breaking things. If you have a perfect classification of which symmetry breaking are allowed, then you can make progress. If you don't understand the symmetry breaking, you are stuck. Okay, our present problem in the electroweak theory is that we don't understand the symmetries of the flavor sector. The flavor sector looks very complicated. There are clear patterns. Those patterns are parameterized by the standard model, but we don't understand them. So something is missing there, and that's why my effective theory, in the moment I touch flavor, gets complicated, because I am missing inputs. 
but still I can try because this is a problem in the effective theory and this is a problem for every model. Okay? In fact, this is the big problem of supersymmetry, for instance. Because in supersymmetry, if you allow the most general Lagrangian, you have too many flavor violations everywhere, you have too many CP violations everywhere. Okay? So it's a general problem that one needs to face. And the effective field theory does not solve the problem, only gives you tools to make something sensible. So you are supposed to write the most general Lagrangian which respect your symmetries and which only is built up with the light degrees of freedom. And all the interesting information, that means short distance information, is hidden in the couplings. So the effective Lagrangian, the only thing it does is allows you to separate predictions which come from symmetry from predictions which come from dynamics. And shows to you how many real unknowns you have. If you work with a particular model, you miss this information because the model is already giving constraints that are model dependent. And that's why you only test your model. Okay? The effective field theory doesn't do that. So it allows you to make a general parametrization so you know the general pattern. And now, over this general parametrization, you can try as many models as you will like. And see, each model will give constraints. So, a priori, the low energy constants are constrained phenomenologically, but I have shown to you that the real progress, the real breakthrough that we need is to understand the pattern of low energy couplings. So, if we know the underlying theory, it's just a technical problem, an engineering problem, take a computer and compute them, that's the QCD case. If we don't know the underlying theory, it's the opposite, we need to measure those low energy couplings, and from the pattern we see experimentally, try to figure out whatever is behind. But there are ways in which we can try to do that. So, I will say that uh, since people have been working a lot in QCD and in chiral perturbation theory, there are many, many things that we know, and we can profit to make progress in the electroweak sector. But, the problem here is much harder because instead of going from up to down, you are going from down to up. Okay, and that's much more difficult. So, uh, even if many people know many things about that, really, if you want to make progress, you need real fresh ideas, something new, okay, to make a breakthrough. So, if anybody uh, likes to work in a place where everything is open and new ideas from young people are needed, this is a perfect field to play. Of course, it's a very difficult one, so good luck. Okay, questions? No, I mean, okay, I, I am perhaps too strong, okay? Yes and no. Asymptotically free theories are perfect theories in the ultraviolet, okay? because they have a perfect ultraviolet property, so we like them. But for, in, for instance, if you want to solve some problems, for instance, the problems of Technicolor, People are work, talking about walking technicolor and things like that because otherwise they cannot understand things at low energy from the underlying theory. Then you need to go beyond asymptotically free theories. You need to look for something else. So you need to look for theories which are not really asymptotically free, but uh, they are not very far from asymptotically free theories which means that some of the ultraviolet conditions of asymptotically free theories are right, but some are not so strong. So you make weaker conditions. But uh, I don't have a clear answer. So we are just uh, looking into the unknown, and we are looking for theories which do what we need to understand data at low energies. Okay, and then people, of course, started with the synthetically free, that's technicolor. 
but then people have been looking to conformal technicolor, to work in technicolor, and 20 names more. And these are just a small variation, making a small modifications of asymptotically free theories. Asymptotically free theory, uh, you understand what it means. Asymptotically free theory means QCD like, okay, where the coupling goes to zero in the ultraviolet. While running a technicolor needs a coupling that it gets flat in some uh, window to understand some particular properties, but well, better we don't enter into that. And conformal technicolor or, or conformal field theories are theories which in a given energy regime have some conformal symmetry. And the first day I was arguing to you that uh, um, things in the electroweak sector for the standard model smell like that maybe at 10 to the 10 GB, 10 to the 12 GB, maybe there could be a conformal symmetry, so no scales, and then scales are generated dynamically. So those are crazy ideas that people are thinking about. More questions? Everybody's tired, so let's go for a coffee.